devastation. In this one moment, it's just almost incomprehensible that they can exist right now. So, and we are grateful. So close. Trigger warning: This podcast is intended for men, not boys, not babies, men. This is how we disable toxic masculinity. We need to kill all men. This pagan patriarchalism that is coming back out of the shadows. Feminists hate patriarchy. It's the woman that runs the show and the woman that runs the community and is the backbone of, of that area. I'm a nasty woman. A loud, vulgar, proud woman. Patriarchy. patriarchy. You are male privilege. Are you saying you have authority over me? Go eat your f***ing superior! I personally can't see why egalitarianism would be a bad thing. The assumption that wives should make babies instead of money is part of the patriarchy. Don't f***ing say hi to strange women you don't know. Patriarchy. The patriarchy. 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 And the second is like it, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. And that is Matthew chapter 22, verse 39. You are on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network, and you are listening to The Patriarchy. My name is Tony Dupani, and I am joined by my co-host, Pastor Joseph Randall Spurgeon. Woman, get back in here and make me a sandwich. Joseph, what kind of sandwich are you eating today? Well, man, I'm... um... I'm actually at this Mexican restaurant. Sure you are. Uh, they're supposed to have this taco bar where you can fill your plate up whenever you, you want to. Like, you just fill it up a whole bunch. Okay. But they, they don't have the bar section open. And so it, it kind of reminds me of this time I was at this one place where there was a bar and a horse walked up to the bar. Okay. And <laughs> the bartender said, hey, you're a hitter a lot. Are you an alcoholic? And the horse pondered for a minute, then responded and said, I don't think I am. And so, poof, he disappeared. Okay. You, you, I mean, the, the funny part of you remember when Descartes said, I think, therefore I am? Yes. So, he said, I don't think I am. And he disappeared. Okay. But are you scraping the bottom of the barrel of the jokes for that one? No, there? I... I started to tell you about the Descartes thing at the beginning, but I thought that would put, be putting the Descartes before the horse. Oh, that was a long build. <laughs> that was okay. I'll give you credit on that. One. <laughs> that was a oh wow. Okay, you've been like planning that for uh, that's that seemed like a it was like a heist movie, man. That was like Ocean's Eleven. You just. Scheming were, that were, in the background. There's lots of different angles that you're running on that one. And yeah. Yeah. There were twists and turns all along the way. Yeah. Yeah. Well done. Well done. I well done. Okay. I'll give you that one. <laughs> all right. Do you do you have no sandwich then? You just you just you just have a, a Mexican I, restaurant with no bar and a horse that isn't therefore I am in some of the cart or something. <laughs> yeah. The That's a long sandwich. That's a big sandwich yep. right there. Yep. Uh well actually I get I, so my wife tonight, um, she made uh, sloppy joes, but she she did like a new recipe, and um, and it had uh, I'm not actually I, I didn't ask her because I had to rush out here to record the show, but um, it was very very good. It had lots of um, it had onions and uh, green and red peppers in it, and uh, I'm not sure what it kind has, of uh, sauce beef. Made. Yeah, 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 yeah. Beef. Yeah, like, 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 like ground up hamburger. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And cheese. No. And ketchup, mustard, and it was in the shape of a muffin. No, <laughs> no, I, t- I t- see. I don't try to hide the cheeseburger muffins, man. I'm proud of the cheeseburger. Mu- you know what? That's it. I'm making a shirt with a cheeseburger muffin on it. If you, everybody that's listening, if you want the shirt with the cheeseburger muffin on it, or a, a coffee mug, or a women's tea with a cheeseburger muffin on it, or whatever, comment down under all the social medias that we're on on this one, and and we'll, we'll get it done. We'll put it on confessional wear. But no, it wasn't a cheeseburger muffin, although it did have some of the same ingredients, I'm sure. 
but it was a really good sloppy joe she had she had a new recipe and we couldn't get enough of it we actually ran out of everything uh, my my five-year-old son is your okay is your five-year-old son like mine in that the kid eats like a teenager my my five-year-old inhales food like it's water uh, i he eats almost as much as i do it's insane like I, I think he's going through a growth spurt obviously but he eats a lot of food well not my oldest son my oldest son is the pickiest eater i've ever known like known to mankind oh but really <laughs> okay the son below him every three words is i'm hungry <laughs> all day long so and that he's <laughs> how old is he three four he's he's uh three three right yep. yeah that's right yeah yep. Yeah. yeah, my my three year old he's a pretty hungry kid, but he is he is the slowest eater out of our family. That kid takes forever to eat his food, and it's because it's not because he's not listening. It's just he just has the best time at dinner. <laughs> he he's telling stories and talking to people, and 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 but you look down and he's still got like most of his plate in front of him, and he just eats like little bits at a time. Whereas my five year old inhales the entire plate and will appear next to you and say. Can I have more? And you're like, yeah, sure. And then like two minutes later, can, can I have more? And I'm like, oh, okay, are you? And he'll ask to a point where you're like, buddy, I think you should, uh, I think you should stop now. I think you're, you're okay. You're gonna get sick. But yeah, he eats a ton. But he really liked the the. Um, I almost said cheeseburger muffins. It's not cheeseburger muffins tonight. Um, but he really liked the uh, sloppy joes. It, it, it was good. I get my wife. She did. She did a really good job. It was you, you're missing it was an opportunity good. though, because you sloppy joes have another name. Okay. Uh, you don't remember the commercial. Maybe you were too too young. But the the the, the other name is the Manwich. Oh yeah, but that's a it comes. I mean, that's a way better name. It, that's that's true. Hey, that's true. Yeah, actually, we, we in fact, should, every sandwich I eat is this a is a Manwich. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Yeah, that what well, that was this. I we didn't actually. I mean, I remember that. Um, I'm not that much younger than you. Goodness. Um, but that that was that always came that big old like red can, right? It was like a dark maroonish like can or whatever. Yeah. Yeah, I do remember that. I think it was pretty good, but I think uh, my my uh, grandmother on my dad's side used to always make uh, um, sloppy joes, and she had like her own recipe in for it. So, but I, I will say this, and not to tarnish the uh, legacy of my my nana, but uh, my wife's uh, sloppy joes are rivaling my nana's. That was, that was pretty good. That was pretty good. Probably because your wife grows the beef, you know, like you, you you raise the cows and she slaughters them and and all that stuff. Yeah, we had to go out back uh, the other day and. I, <laughs> Kill Betsy. Kill Betsy. So, okay, we'll, we'll do this, then we got to get going. But true story, the property I live on here, because it was my grandfather's, he did have a cow at one point when my mom was growing up out here. And then one day he didn't have a cow, and they had steaks on the table, and the kids asked my grandfather where, I think her name was Bessie. Or it it might have been Betsy, but I think it was Bessie. Where Bessie was, <laughs> my grandfather was like, you're eating her. <laughs> <laughs> and then all the kids, I guess, apparently just started like, you know, crying and wouldn't eat it. And so he, he, I remember him telling me the story and he said uh, that he, he's like, well, I just, I had my own steak for a long time. <laughs> it just nice. kept eating it. I was like, Hey, that's one way of getting steak every night for a couple of weeks. Okay. So we got to move on because we're on time crunch right now. So we have a new uh, segment for everybody. That's Racist. Okay, and this video comes to us from HuffPost. It's called, Why We Need to Talk About White Feminism. I have not heard this. Uh, Joseph has. This should be fun. You might have heard the term white feminism used lately. After Nicki Minaj and Taylor Swift's Twitter exchange, or when people critique HBO's girls. Wait, okay, fill me in here, because uh, I, I don't really care about Nicki Minaj or Taylor Swift, but did they get in a fight over this, or are they agreeing that there's something called white feminism? Uh, I think they got to the fight it on this. I'm, I'm not exactly Goodness. sure. Oh, man. That should have been a fun fight. Okay. This segment could be called Feminism Ruins Everything, too. The, yeah. Well. Including itself. Including, I was going <laughs> to say, it, it, yeah. It, yeah. Cannibalistic feminism. I guess we could have that as a new segment. But what does it mean? Basically, white feminism is feminism that ignores intersectionality. So not all feminists who are white are white feminists. But most white feminists are white because white people just don't have to think about things like race on a daily basis. And we're not just... Wait, but that, that, that girl's white that's saying that. Yeah. But not all white feminists are white feminists. Are white. 
But well, no, no, all white, not all white feminists are or white, white feminists. No. Is this like is this like black hat hacking and white hat hacking and there's like the the good feminists and the bad feminists and the feminists. No, no, I, no, it's not. No, it's not black hat, white hat. Though I mean, I'm very confused. The, because you're that's a racist thing for you to say because in that black hat white right. hat the black hat's a bad hat what about brown hat that's the evil people brown and hat. this you got to get it right that actually the white is the evil and the black is the good or anything not white is the good so you can be white and a feminist and not white feminist but most white feminists are white feminists according to this but can you be a, a feminist and not a dumb feminist No. Okay, we're going to move on. <laughs> Just pulling the race card. White feminism excludes the experiences of basically anyone who's not white, cis, and straight. Here's why that's so problematic. First, it assumes the way white women experience misogyny is the way all women experience misogyny. And that's just not true. White feminism aims to close the wage gap between men and women. But what it fails to recognize is that most of the time, Latina and black women make even less than white women. And police brutality should be viewed as a feminist issue, but it doesn't affect white women the way it affects women of color. If Sandra Bland had been a white woman, would a simple traffic stop have resulted in an arrest? Would she be viewed as a loud, angry black woman? Would she be dead? White feminism ignores Oh man, this is so bad. You you got to keep it going because the ending is the best. Oh okay, okay. Oh, this is uh... or the worst, whichever you want. I think I'm getting ear cancer from listening to this, but okay, we'll keep going. Is the role that whiteness plays in creating things like beauty standards. For example, this is okay, but this isn't. White women are most often the faces of feminism. Tina Fey, Tara Swift. Amy Schumer have been able to break into industries that have been dominated by cis white men. But black women, women of color, we face barriers that white women don't. Critiquing white feminism is- Whoa, what? What? I, so, oh, this is, this is gonna give me cancer. Keep going, man. Keep going. Okay. You, you, it's, 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 I'm just like, this is so, they're showing pictures of all these different, and they're saying, they're critiquing Taylor Swift and, and but I'm no fan of Taylor Swift, but they're they're critiquing Taylor Swift and whatever because she's white and stuff. But I'm like, uh, I don't know. There's like J Lo and Beyonce and Oprah and on and on and on that are perfectly more probably than Taylor Swift successful. But uh, hey, that doesn't count. Okay, uh, whatever. All right, moving on. Isn't about silencing those women. It's about opening up space for even more diverse voices to be heard. And that's great for everyone. Being a white feminist doesn't make you a bad person. It just means you have a lot to learn. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> the way she says it, the way she... Oh, I know we don't do this on video, but the way that she says it and the way her face looks is the most condescending thing I've ever seen. <laughs> oh, and I love it because they're just eating each other alive. Okay, yeah, we yeah. should have a segment just called Cannibalistic Feminism. This is what it is. Okay, all right, we're almost at the end. We're almost at the end. I can make it. The most important thing any white feminist can do is educate herself and listen and engage with the experiences of women of color without silencing them. Because sometimes as white ladies, we just have to shut the f*** up. <laughs> okay. Wow. That's... Could she... And what's funny is that's a white woman saying that. Yeah, uh, well, but she's she's not a white feminist, though. I'm she's sure she's one, she's one of the... Uh, I wouldn't say minorities because <laughs> that's probably not allowed. But uh, she's uh, she's like the rare unicorn, um, the the non-white feminist, white feminist who's white but not white. I don't know, whatever. That that I'm gonna need to like have. You have, might need uh, to lay down for a while. Oh, man, <laughs> oh man, that is oh, it's just it's it's truly just so dumb. I mean, listening to that kind of stuff, it it's it's. Oh, it's just watching it's it I mean in in many ways it's sad because it is watching God just give people over to their their foolishness but it, it is oh it is so frustrating well, cuz there's just no logic to it it's just all emotion and and so oh, okay anyway go ahead I need, I need time it's a, <laughs> it is a, a there's this little um I don't know you may have sent it to me I can't remember who sent it to me 
but I posted it on on my social media recently. Like, how do you know something is racist? And it's uh, a flow chart. That was Babylon B. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the flow chart is like, uh, does does it exist? <laughs> it's racist. <laughs> it's racist. I showed that. Yeah, yeah. I know. I saw that in yours. I showed that to my wife, and she laughed. And she was like, "It's true, though." And I'm like, "I know. That's it's basically that's the only criteria for being a racist is uh, you exist." Yeah. So uh, you just flip through man. something, and you, it's so. And in this case, feminism is racist. Which, hey, I'm okay with that. If, if, yeah, it's racist. Let's get rid of feminism. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Oh, goodness. That's so dumb. Oh, mm. so dumb. Maybe we can cancel feminism for being racist. That's fine. I don't care. Give me any reason to cancel feminism. It's, it's, oh, there's multiples. Speaking of the cancel thing, uh, there's that, that woman that was canceled from Star Wars. Yes. Uh, what was uh, her name? Um, Gina. Uh, her, Gina. K- Something or another. K- yeah. Those are the C. I can't remember her last name. She's, she's, she's the, uh, former, uh, MMA women's champion thing, whatever, something like that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so she was canceled for saying some things about in support of Trump and some of the stuff she said wasn't really that. I don't understand why they canceled her over. Well, it. she said stuff in support of Trump and then she questioned things about masks and said something about vaccines. And I, that was enough to basically make her the devil incarnate. And, uh, so she's a feminist, but she's a white feminist. Why would you say she's a feminist? Just <laughs> That's, it is a little ironic to see all of the conservatives jump. I mean, she shouldn't have got canceled from Star Wars. I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I think that's wrong. I mean, I, I've said that and whatever, but it's just funny to all of a sudden a bunch of people are just like, yeah, but it's okay because she she made a career uh, trying to make herself look like a man and beating the crap out of other women. That's good. Yeah. And, and then, and then you have supposed conservatives like uh, uh, Ben Shapiro. Like yes. we're going to make conservative films, yeah, that have nudity and feminism, right? Like the first film they put out is a basically a woman warrior, right? It's got nudity in it, but they're not undermining America's foundation. They say that they're they're, they're doing this to to. And th- what this shows us is that uh, the conservatives, they just don't have a, a what they, it's like, it's that old Chesterton quote about the progressives prog- progress and the conservatives come on the scene and they, they conserve what the progressives have already changed. Yeah. And that's what this is. So it's like American values now include women warriors and, We've said this many, many times on here, talking about like the gun bunnies and all those stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, it's destructive, and uh, it's destructive when you think about um, as a whole. But it's destructive even to the conservative movement. Uh, um, you try to mention something about like this. Well, you know, wh- why don't you know? They're like, we don't want to go down the path of socialist and communist, and we don't want to go down the path of Joe Biden and all the. The liberals, and then you, then you say something. Well, why don't we, you know, for example, why don't we rethink women's suffrage, or why don't we, yeah, <laughs> rethink women being warriors? And then they're like, uh, "Oh, you're the, you're a Nazi, dude. You're a KKK. You're like, uh, I don't want to, I don't." But then you say, "Well, all our founding fathers believe these things," and they're like, "Well, I, when I said I wanted to go back to the founding fathers, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't, I didn't mean that." I want to go back to the Saturday morning cartoon version of the Founding Fathers and everything squeaky clean and yep. no, nobody fought with anything and nobody stood for anything. But yeah, I the it really does infuriate me that especially conservatives don't understand why having women warriors is such a bad thing. Because it's just a cursory glance at history. You don't send your women to war. Like, you don't. It destroys a nation. There is no future. There, I, I mean, even just from that, I'm, I'm not. I'm not saying there's there's more biblical reasons for that. But even just face value, paganism <laughs> would have told you throughout history you don't send your women to war. But for some reason, our woke, semi woke uh, conservatives, because I I feel like a lot of them are semi woke, closet woke, um, just don't get it. And it's it they they yeah they look at you like you're just this awful person. Oh, how could how could you say that? You, what if they they can do whatever they want to do? Like yeah, but is it good? <laughs> what's the what's the uh, the quote? Uh, just just because uh, 
what is it just because he can doesn't mean he should or something like that yeah and and, and all this kind of modern conservatism kind of going with along with the flow of it's it's like 10 years behind 15 years behind yes progressivism it's a lot like Christianity. And, I was just, and, yes, I was just going to say. I was going to say it's a lot like Christian movie, uh, Christian music in the nineties, right? <laughs> right, like yeah. we're just ten years behind so whatever true. is popular. That's so true. But um, one of the things that's done is that uh, all of this, the rebellion everywhere, is that uh, the United States birth rate. Mm-hmm. Uh, I was looking at this the other day. It's below the rate of France. <clears throat> Uh, so the, the 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 French, you know, we always kind of make a joke that the, the French were cowards and stuff. We had to save them in World War II. Well, our birth rate's below theirs. It's below the Swedes, and it's below North Korea. <laughs> so that, let that, that sink in for a moment. Is, yeah, that last one. Wow. I mean, that's a communist dictatorship where people are starving to death and it has a higher birth rate than the United States does. Yeah. And are shot if they try and run across the border to South Korea. Yeah. The, oh man. Wow. That's, I knew the other ones. I didn't know the, the North Korea one. That's, that's insane. So the United States is about 1.7, uh, 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 children per f- uh, couple, 1.7 the replacement rate to be able to maintain our current population rate is 2.1. Yeah. So 1.7. North Korea is 1.9. So we're yeah, we're below them. Wow. And let me let me tell you one more thing, if you don't mind. Put on your tinfoil hat for me. Uh Uh-oh. if you don't mind. Let me call Matt Williams. Sorry. <laughs> I love you, Matt. So I think we've played this song before. Maybe you can cue it up and play it later on. Um there's this song with Alex Jones. You remember that that kind of nut conspiracy theory guy? Yeah. And somebody took this clip of him like pounding on the table and made it into a song. And he slams his hand on the table and he says, I don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the freaking frogs gay. <laughs> I do. Yeah, we played that on. I think it was the talk like a man or something like that. I can't remember. It was something like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, so you, it's crazy. He's loony, but. Uh, there's actually several articles recently from the Washington Post, Science Wire, Live Science, the NC Register, and the Geological Society that kind of make him not sound so tinfoily. That is, uh, uh, the in fact, the U.S. Geological Society has revealed that there's a chemical infiltrating many waterways in both the United States and Europe, and it's having a large impact on fish and amphibians, so frogs. What the chemical is doing is impacting the reproductive systems of fish and amphibians, uh, even three generations removed from the initial exposure of it. So like it, it, this impacts them three generations on. And so what it does is it, it, it causes harmful mutations in the body of a fish or a frog, um, which reacts to this chemical as if it were a natural estrogen. And so it demasculizes male animals. It creates a condition called intersex that interferes with the animal's ability to reproduce. So the frogs are intersectional? <laughs> this was turning them into? <laughs> intersex, not inter. Uh, oh. oh, okay. I mean, sorry. They're, I just, you know, just hearing that all yeah. the time. It's, it's like a SJW uh, chemical in the water. <laughs> social justice social, frogs. Social justice frogs. Pepe, Pepe the social justice frog. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, um, but anyways, they're intersex. So what is the chemical? My guess is, because uh, I think I heard wind of this, but my guess was even before I heard it, that it was something to do with uh, morning after pill or similar. Yeah, yeah well, uh, not, not just the morning after pill. It's ethanol estriol, which is the active ingredient in birth control. Mm-hmm. So after it passes through the water, I mean, through the woman who's attempting to circumvent her fruitfulness, it goes into the water supply and continues to be effective. And so because the pill has become so widely used, large enough amounts are entering the waterways that scientists are writing articles and they're concerned about the damage it may be doing. And so they're trying to find ways to filter it out of the water. And the, the thing is, just like the conservatives who like just want to conserve enough, these articles uh, um, 
they go to great lengths to say, well, we're not trying to tell women not to have birth control or not to use birth control. <laughs> we're just saying it's going to destroy the world. <laughs> it's just it's just destroying nature. It's just destroying we find everything. Ways to make it safe. The human race is going to die out. You know, like, there's just that. You know, like, so so we're actually at a point in our history where we are uh, where our sin is impacting the world around us. Obviously, this this happened since Adam. You know, when he sinned, he brought the curse upon the world. Our sin, our rebellion against God continues to do that in the creation around us. Mm-hmm. Um, and part of this is we, we've joked about the results of feminism, and, and but really it, it kind of similar to what Paul says in 2 Timothy chapter 3. He, he's he talking about last days, perilous times shall come. Now, I'm, I, don't, I don't want you to think, oh, we've gone dispensationalist and we're meaning we're in like the end times and Kirk Cameron's about to save us and all that stuff. True story. Um, I, I think I heard Kirk Cameron's actually not a dispensationalist anymore. Yeah, I yeah, know he's not. Yeah. But, uh, um, but it says in the last days, perilous times shall come. So we do live in the last days. Since Christ came, that's been the last days. But uh, it says, for men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy. And then the next one's the one I really wanted to focus on is without natural affection. Um, this is the same thing it mentions in the book of Romans when it talks about God giving people over. Uh, the list of sins at the end of Romans chapter 1, when it goes through all these lists of sins, Romans one thirty one says they are without natural affection. Mm-hmm. What's happening is we live in a time where people don't even want to have children because they lack the natural affection for children. They lack the natural affection for the people around them. Everything's racist, and when everything's racist, nothing is. And uh, and because everything is racist, and because we're so afraid of that, we're afraid to be able to like. Love the people around us, the people that are most like us, the people that are closest to us, like our families. Just the natural affection you should have for your neighbors, your your city, patriotism. Um, all these things are lacking in such a way that uh, we're not even reproducing. And our, our, our people, our nation is on its way to dying. So... Speaking of natural affection, it would be really good for us. Uh, there's a, a couple of men that have written a book on this very topic, on uh, who our neighbor is, what what history has shown, what um, what scripture shows, what uh, the history of the church has taught on the issue of natural affection. And so I think it'd be good to bring them on the show, talk to them about that topic. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we're going to be on the line with Daryl Dow and Thomas Acord. So stick around. You are listening to The Patriarchy on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. We'll be right back. This is Polly the Transparent with an important public service announcement. These yahoos over at the Patriarchy Podcast collaborated with some other yahoos over at Confessional Wear to bring all their gun-toting, misogynistic, homophobic, Bible-thumping, brain-dead, minion yahoos some Patriarchy merchandise. Yeah, they're actually selling t-shirts and coffee mugs to promote this trash. Even t-shirts for women. I'd say I can't believe it, but let's face it, these are the same buffoons that send boxes of Fruit Loops to my door addressed to the Fruit Loop that lives there who thinks he's a parrot. Intolerant pieces of garbage. Of course I'm a parrot. Anyways, this crap is available on confessionalware.com under podcast collaborations. Not that any normal person would buy that junk. Squawk. Hey, lady. Polly needs his papers changed again. The lack of service around this place is unbelievable. We're on the line with Daryl Dow and Thomas Acourt. 
Daryl is a Statistician has been published in Chronicles Magazine of American Culture on CrossPolitik, Antiwar.com, and American Remnant. He is the co-author of Who Is My Neighbor, an anthology in natural relations, and he's married to his wife of 25 years, and together they have three children. Thomas lives in the southern U.S. He served in the United States military. He is the headmaster of a classical Christian school. He is the author of The Soul in the City and is also the co-author of Who Is My Neighbor. He is the co-host of the podcast Ars Politica, and he is married to his wife of eight years, and together they have four children. Daryl and Thomas, welcome to the patriarchy. Thanks for having us. We're, we're glad to have you guys on here. Before we get started, you guys are okay being out of the sexist now? <laughs> <laughs> Well, you got to add to all of the where they're going to be. They're going to be outed as uh, what sexist, misogynist, bigots. Uh, um, I don't know what are all the other things. Racist. That racist. Oh yeah, ra- definitely racist. I mean, just just by virtue of of being alive, you're a racist. I think. Well, welcome to the show. Um, again, that we're ha- we're interviewing both of you. So uh, if you start to cut each other off, feel free to to do that or cut us off. But. Uh, uh, I'll probably I'll start with you, Daryl, uh, to make it a little easier. Um, you have recently written a book, the uh, um, "Who Is Your Neighbor." Give us a little background on uh, maybe just a quick summary of what the book is about, and then some background on on why you and Thomas decided to uh, put the, put this book together. The book itself is uh, is an anthology. It uh, is, in some sense, designed to be used as a reference tool, a reference book. It's uh, quite large. It's about 600 pages in length uh, and is, uh, again, mostly just a collection of quotations spanning a, a time frame from uh, the present back, uh, you know, 2,500 years. And... Uh, we attempted to categorize it. Categorizing and organizing that information was was difficult. Uh, and we do have some introductory uh, materials and an afterword, and then there are introductions to um, kind of various time periods or uh, descriptions of uh, various religious groups and so on. And so the book is primarily about what we would call uh, natural affections. Um, attachments to place, attachments to people, uh, fellow feeling, your uh, place in the world as it relates uh, in in your relationship vertically to God, but how that manifests itself uh, really in a a series of of, of, uh, pious relationships really with those around us, our neighbors uh, to varying degrees. in terms of the, the genesis of this particular project, uh, it was around 2014, 2015, and um, uh, I, I started to create this document where I was uh, haphazardly assembling quotations that uh, I could use um, you know, in some sense in like online debates and things of that nature. Um, that touched on on these issues, and then I guess what I would call downstream political issues. So uh, that that period of 2015, 2016, um, of course, was uh, you know the the, the beginning of um, kind of a tumultuous period um, culturally, politically within the church in terms of discussion of some of these issues, and. Um, at that point, uh, Thomas and I started to uh, basically work to um, put this document together, and uh, we ultimately decided that it was uh, it, it had utility to be published. It was, uh, I think, a useful a useful tool um, for our, our our brothers and sisters. So, uh, you, you know, to me, we were we were trying to get. Um, a historical record, and of course, you know the, the amount of material here is vast, and we really just skim the surface of it, um, even in a book this size, and uh, and so, you know, you're trying to get a, a, at least a buffet style uh, view of how our uh, fathers in the faith, and uh, temporally for that matter, our civic fathers thought about uh, a lot of these issues of, of natural relations, and, um, and, and we wanted to, to get that on the record. Um, 
speaking personally, so I, I'm a Gen Xer, uh, but I have found myself in recent years interacting more with younger men um, who are, are millennials, you know, say at least a half generation or more younger than me. And one of the things that I guess I've noticed is that there's a, uh, a demoralization among a lot of these young men in particular. And, uh, you know, in, in some ways, a lot of us, uh, if, we're, if we're kind of conservative, orthodox um, men, are, are alienated from a lot, a lot of the institutions of American life. And, uh, and, and it's, it's difficult then to ask people um, to conserve <laughs> um, something that they've in some sense never seen. Right, so so part of the the impetus for me here um, was to uh, help people to understand that even if they're they're gaslit to the point where they they think they're alone and they're demoralized, they really are part of this much larger chorus that extends backward millennia. Uh, they're not on the wrong side of history, so to speak, and so um, we thought that it would be, again, a useful tool to give um, to people. And, and hopefully they open it again and, and look and uh, track down the, 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 the men that we cite, the authors that we cite, the works that we cite. There are hundreds of them. Uh, and they begin to see, again, kind of the, the grandeur and the, the deep rootedness of the civilization that they're a part of. And, uh, and again, we're, we're facing fairly trying times, and we're going to have to do a lot of rebuilding. Our sons are, are going to have to do a lot of rebuilding. And, uh, and so they're going to have to, I think, look to the past to, um, to understand how it is you know, we got to this point and where it is we can go. So in some sense, you're encouraging uh, people to hop up on the shoulders of their ancestors and peer around and, and take a look at the world as they saw it and to look around you know, at our own culture, what's left of it, to see the, the fingerprints and the imprints of that and, uh, and project that into the future. Something you hit on earlier about conserving something that we haven't seen. Uh, Tony and I were talking before we had you on about how conservatives, we were, we were kind of playing off that Chesterton, I think it was Chesterton, that uh, conservatives are conserving what the liberals have advanced on. And, uh, and so we were talking about that, but we're talking about conserving something that we haven't seen. And so uh, let me ask you, um, Thomas, can you give us like a, a maybe just a little bit more in depth on what natural affection is and what you guys mean by con building on something you haven't seen? Yeah, so when I think of natural affection, I think of sort of the loves, the natural tendencies that we have, the, aff the affinities we have for those around us from birth, uh, the baby goes right to the mother, right after birth. I mean, right then and there. And the baby is calm. When that happens, it's natural. That's the sort of thing we're talking about inside of us also. We do that with our parents. We do that with our siblings. If we do that with people around us and things around us too. It's not just people. It's food, sights. It's the smell of the air in springtime in the place that you're familiar with. Um, and, and there's so many ways of explaining this too with language, sports, even it could be sports or holidays, uh, flowers. I mean, there's a particular flower on a mountain that people sing about, you know, in Austria. And uh, these are the sorts of things, and they're everywhere. It's, it's, it's so pervasive. And having a love for those things around you that are near to you and familiar to you uh, is natural. But, and that's, it's sort of a, a mundane observation, but, the implications of this are profound, uh, so profound that if you neglect them, it, you can really do damage to a society or to a people, to uh, a population. For instance, if we try to organize ourselves politically in a way that doesn't account for these, for this natural extension of love 
these these the ordo amoris, as Augustine said, if we don't account for that, and we or we try to order ourselves politically in a way that, that neglects it or subverts it, re- reverses it, we end up having collapsed institutions and uh, a breakdown of, of uh, social order in various ways. And you see that, I think, all over the West today, we see this breakdown. And I would say, I would argue that among other among other factors, but one central one is the this not accounting for this natural love that's inside of all of us for the things that immediate to us. And even this isn't just a Christian idea. Pagans, or they wouldn't call themselves pagans, but you know Roman authors who worship Jupiter or something, they understood this. Uh, Greeks understood this. Egyptians, uh, Chinese people have understood this, and they've written about it. And uh, one of the things we have in our book is a is a, one of the things our book does is it catalogs a lot of this and shows you how people have expressed it throughout time, throughout different cultures, and they're trying to, to say what it looks like from their point of view, what the privation of it does to them. Um, and so I think it's a very um, uh, a very, like a Daryl said, a very good tool to help us envision this thing that so we feel like we, we don't really have much of it because we're sort of in the, the post period of of the loss of this. And so by looking from the standpoint of other peoples and other times where they did have it or they were at some different stage in the process of this thing developing or uh, falling apart, you can get a view on what this has been uh, how, for for other people, how what it's been like, how it's how it's been implemented, the good or the bad. One thing I say to people who are getting into classical education, for instance, is that you know classical education has been used by some people to do bad things, and we can learn from that and draw out the good things and throw out the bad things. So even even if there's negative examples, which I don't know if we have a lot of those, uh, but there, there might be, and you can, you can learn from both the good and the bad um, in various times. One of the things I think I found interesting in our day is that, especially right now, is with the onset of all the social justice stuff, it, it's like somewhere deep down, uh, even unbelievers understand that we should have some kind of regard for our fellow man, and and that there that that's built into us. Of course, social justice mars all of that, and ends up actually making it about really mostly about yourself. But um, so building on that, in, in everything you were talking about, you have all of these quotes in your book, and you went through history, and you've seen uh, examples in history, uh, both within Christianity and without a Christianity, um, of the natural affections towards uh, other people and towards your fellow man. Where in that, or, or can you kind of build from that? I, I know we're, we have limited time in an interview, and you're probably just going to tell me, go read the book. Um, valid point. Uh, <laughs> but <laughs> if you could give us a little bit of a snippet from it of where you think that breakdown started to happen within our culture, or, or even if we can look to other cultures of where that breakdown starts to happen in a culture um, to where we, we lost uh, that natural affection. Oh, I think it's difficult to point to the place where we lost it. People have tried to point in many ways uh, to the French Revolution or some Enlightenment idea of individualism. I think that has some merit. People have tried to go on further back and shown that in the West, the European mind had this idea of individualism back in the Middle Ages. But I would say that it has something to do with with the self with the individual, even I think Carl Truman wrote a recent book called the, um, the self, the rise and triumph of the modern self. And he's trying to show the same thing that this looking at the human being as this atomized individual who's shorn of any ties or bonds or duties to those around him or her. I think that has, that has a lot to do with it. I also think that there's a, there's a decidedly anti-Christian um, I don't know what you want to call it, force, de- demonic force, uh, ideology 
uh, an anti-Western, anti-European ideologies that all kind of coalesce into this this movement that wants to unravel um, any sort of communal relationship that West what modern Western man has. One thing I, Daryl may, mentioned earlier is that especially um, white Western Christian males today you find yourself having no exclusive social clubs, mm. no, no group that you can go to. There's, there's clubs and there's groups for every, every other identity matrix you can, you can imagine, but not for you. Uh, the only ones, I mean, we don't even have bathrooms anymore, right? We don't have anything at all. And the forces that, that it are, are trying to, uh, that are that are doing this, it's not just individualism. I would say that's that's a, a feature, but it it also has something to do with trying to make sure that that this certain demographic never again uh, comes together in some kind of evil, tyrannical, imperial, fascist um, you know movement. And I think I think so. You could say it's a it's a late modern iteration that we're dealing with today that has that has old roots in various uh other other ideas but uh, i think that's that's the big one that we're we're working with today and i think the weakening of of these kind of natural and organic connections uh family and nation or even the idea of patriarchy that you guys are interested in that these things have obvious spiritual implications so the the goal in some sense is the subversion of of Christian nations and the culture uh, that was produced by Christendom right or the remnant that is left uh, of that so if you can uh, if you can kind of deconstruct and delegitimize the culture that it produced uh, you undermine Christianity itself right the cultus the the religion that was the foundation of the civilization so that's that's the target and so um, all of these kind of things right I mean scripture speaks in terms of uh, these kinds of metaphors to help us to understand salvation and to understand God and to understand our faith right so within the Trinity there's a relationship between a father and a son and our relationship as Christians is one that we are we are brothers okay so the the natural relationships that I have with my um, natural brothers are supposed to in some ways point me to this bigger transcendent reality so uh, and 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 the on the negative side of this right I mean apostasy uh, is uh, a spiritual adultery so um, it's not really a surprise when adultery is winked at that so is apostasy um, when you undermine uh, patriarchy when you undermine the the relationships within a family when you kind of redefine these things your target is uh, again the transcendent kind of Christian realities be behind it so I think Thomas is right that the roots of this are are fairly long and in some ways again this is you know has been not exactly a, a frontal attack on on Christianity it's been more uh, subversive and, and, and kind of uh, surreptitious than that right you're trying to undermine the the cultural framework to get at the center and so again I think you know as you undermine these kind of natural relationships you you have this broader target that the that the enemy is after so Dara, I hear you talking about, and you've mentioned Christian nations, and um, and these natural relationships. But what do you say to I don't you know the the gospel coalition types? The Christian nationalism is is a wicked and evil thing, and the the church has, in one sense, replaced these natural relations. That's that's I think that's kind of what they are teaching. 
is the church has replaced them or it oversees them so much that they don't matter so much. What do you, how do you, how do you respond to that? I, you know, I, I, I mean, I've responded in, in some sense at, at length in, in writing if, if people are interested in that. But I think that, again, the idea of, uh, of the, the nation is, uh, is, is natural. And I think it's, I think it's quite biblical. It's assumed um, by, by scripture, right? So a, a nation traditionally would be defined as, as this, um, you know, group of people, an ethnic group, they have a collective identity and a common ancestry and uh, some kind of shared lineage and myths and common historical memories and attachments to a particular piece of land and a shared culture and, and language and religion and traditions and customs and so on and, a, and an awareness of this ethnicity. Uh, and again, I don't think these categories are hard and uh, and impermeable, right? Uh, so Israel is a mixed multitude, for example, right? So uh, in the same way that families can grow via adoption, uh, you know, nations can do this too. But it's it's not it's not normative, right? But I think very clearly this uh, that kind of understanding of of a nation is what we see. Um, defined in scripture uh, you know so it, it, you can take any number of passages particularly in the in the Old Testament um, that uh, in in numbers two for example right we see the, um, the, the, the they're they're gathered and they're gathered around the standards of their fathers right so they have this symbol uh, around which the tribes gather uh, that is tied to this kind of natural relationship that they have with with other members of their of their tribe uh, so again I don't think you know nations aren't going anywhere we certainly see them in the eschaton and revelation uh, and 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 so on so um, those <laughs> those folks at the gospel coalition frankly are are simply uh, wrong about that right N nations are a fundamental part of of god's economy from uh from genesis to revelation and uh and and again i think the denial of this is 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 sub-biblical and and i mean again nations just a, a proper definition of of a nation is really it's it's an extended family right i mean this is in some ways just a an application of the of the fifth commandment um when we honor our mother and father we also honor our ancestors right when we honor our mother and father we also honor our our civic fathers and uh, and I think Christians of every conceivable stripe have recognized this, as we basically prove in our book. Uh, and and so I, I think this conception is again relatively new, uh, and and I don't think it uh, I don't think it's biblical. Could I can I make a comment also to that? Go ahead. So Go ahead. when when people say that thank you when when people say that nationalism or excuse me. Uh, nationalism or the idea of nations uh, either are have been displaced by uh, the gospel or something. Uh, one thing to note is that no one said this uh, prior to our modern age. Like Christians did not say this. But Christians have said, uh, theologians have said, that God, you know, the gospel takes priority. The kingdom of heaven takes priority. Martin Luther wrestled with this a lot. You can read what he wrote and Aquinas and Augustine and many others. But the idea that nations are these things that we can just let go of or whatever, that that does not ring true to the historical record. And one of the reasons we've tried to get our work out there is to show people the the this this in factuality. You can see people talking about being a nation. And, and being self-conscious of this fact, all the way back to uh, like the 2000s BC, as, as far as we have record. I mean, really, like on on stones that are digging up, that, that are dug up out of uh, out of sites in in Egypt or something, we can read about people rallying together to fight, to defend their particularity against some foreign invader. 
and they're rallying around their sacred hearts and their their peoplehood. And you can see this in the Middle Ages, where uh, Bede writes about his Gens Anglorum, the English people, uh, the Scottish Declaration of Abra, the 1320, asserting the right of the Scottish nation to be independent from England as a people. Uh, the Danes, the Germans, the Czechs, the um, bo the uh, people in Moravia and Bohemia, uh, the it, it, everywhere this happens. The Serbs. So to say that this is that because we were in this new age, we can just sort of declare that this is this is gone. It sort of reminds me. I don't want to make a, any kind of draw any so associations here and say these people are promoting these ideas, but it sort of reminds me of the transgender movement that says we can just declare gender to be irrelevant and we can just say it because we it's the modern age it's 2021 and i feel a certain way and i'm just going to declare it and therefore i'm i'm past what humans throughout all history uh, have had to experience uh, or have had to wrestle with and to deal with and uh, i don't think you're going to you're going to bypass this so easily there's a, there's a saying i think by horace that says you can drive nature out with a pitchfork but it'll come right back in every time. And I think that's what people will find here. The The goal, and we'll get to this a little later, I guess, but the goal is not to abandon the past, but to thoroughly understand it and learn from it and carry on the good from it. And, and I think if we if we neglect it, and we call it all bad, some of this stuff's going to come back to haunt us. And I think a lot of the woke movement, for instance, that wants to call everyone racist or... Whatever I think we're, we're, we are the culture that cried wolf, racist wolf. Okay, we, we keep saying this to people that there's that all this stuff is bad that everybody is a wolf, so to speak. Well, at some point, people are going to grow hardened to that, and they're going to neglect when, if and when bad things happen again. And so, you know, I think I think a, a true appreciation of these things, uh, just like a true appreciation of alcohol, or a true appreciation of of um, when, you know, love, like a uh, passionate love, you you have to treat it properly. If you try to just throw it away and totally neglect it, first of all, you're rejecting something God made, which is what Daryl said about nationalism. And second of all, nature's going to come back up, and it's going to come back up roaring and screaming. And we're not going to know what to do with it when that happens. I, th I think if I can throw in just one other quick point, because um, we've probably beaten this already, but, uh, you know, in Acts 17, when, when Paul is uh, addressing the Greeks, he says that uh, from one man every nation is is created, and, and God uh, allots the, the periods and the boundaries of the dwelling places of these nations, and he does this for a specific reason that they should seek God and perhaps feel their way toward him and find him. So even those borders, those boundaries, those nations, those languages created by God uh, point again to this, to this bigger reality. But even the Great Commission would seem to uh, uh, assume not the flattening or the destruction of nations, um, but their their restoration and their perfection. Um, so I, I I don't think that that nations are are done away with uh, from any teaching of the of the New Testament. Yeah, it's funny. Just today, um, I came across uh, I think it was on Facebook. There's an ad for a uh, well, it was supposed to be advertised as a uh, men's uh, support group app, something like that. I believe it was called Tether. And um, somebody on it asked um, if if there was a space for it in it for trans men, and the uh, the app actually responded back that oh yes, just it's for anybody that identifies as masculine. And it was just funny because that made me think of when you were talking earlier about there's just no space. They, there there is no space for for men <laughs> right now at all, real men. Um, and that's just kind of the the route that our culture is going to and. Uh, so that actually brings me to my, my last question here, and we're going to have to wrap this up fairly quick here. Um, but what are some practical advice from you guys? Uh, and you know what? We'll start with you, Thomas. Um, in terms of men that are looking to try to 
remedy this in in their society, maybe in their own lives. Maybe they've just kind of become hardened other people because of just how things are, or they're trying to teach it to their children. Um, you can pick any one of those three or, or any anything in between on it, but just something practical for a man listening to this um, that's interested in this particular uh, subject, this particular virtue as we're, as we're teaching in this too, and wants to make some kind of a change around them, whether that's in their home uh, or in their workplace or in their uh, society around them. Yeah, so the first thing I would say is you have to find out, you have to realize where you are in the stage of things. So we, so John Quincy Adams, uh, this is a quote from him that I remember, he said, I am a warrior so that my son may be a merchant and so that his son may be a poet. Mm-hmm. And who was John Quincy Adams? Well, he was one of the founding fathers, or maybe like a post-founding father. But he, he saw himself in a particular stage of social development. And his job was not to relax, sort of like David. David was the warrior who had to clear things out. He was not the man to build the temple. Solomon was the man of peace to build the temple and enjoy the prosperity that his father cleared the path for. And so I think this is my interpretation. Okay, you may be in a different locale, but generally speaking in the West in America, we are in the position where we need, uh, you know, bad times create hard men. We need hard men. Mm-hmm. Um, Douglas Wilson said, I'm going to butcher him. So his, I'm going to paraphrase him. He said, uh, dangerous times call for, uh, for hard men, <clears throat> and uh, careful men come later and write their biographies. And so for the first thing I would say is practically take a situational awareness of, of what's going on around you and what you need to do. Um, what are the community what's – what's it like where you are, your church, your, your job, the institutions, and build there. And if you don't know where to – if you're like, I don't know where, I don't even know where to start, well, start at home. The family, every political philosopher – in history, all of them have said that the family is the basis of society. This is so true that that even those who want to destroy society started with the family because they knew it was the basis. You can read a lot of feminist literature about this, talking about how we are going to target the family and destroy the family because it's the basis. So if you want to destroy a big tower, break up the foundation. Uh, so you can start at home. This is what I tell a lot of my political philosophy students. After you take a political philosophy class, oh my gosh, what do I do? I want to change the world. Well, uh, to quote another guy, Jordan Peterson, he said, go clean your room. <laughs> if you can't clean your room, then you can't clean up society. So start at home. If you're not married, work toward gaining skills to make yourself productive and you can provide for a wife. Go get married. Have children. Uh, provide for them, raise them, nurture them, catechize your children, uh, lead your wife well, show show them what a man looks like, uh, a godly, a God-fearing man. And so I think that's one of the easiest and best places. And in fact, if you don't do that, then all the rest is you know, unless you just don't, you can't have a family for some reason. But it, all all the rest is um, you're you're putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. And and Paul said this about elders. Um, again, I have to paraphrase, but the, the elder must be a man who can, who can lead his family. If his children are following him, if he can't lead his household, how is he going to lead the church? Okay, if he can't lead – okay, we're talking materially speaking here. right? Now, if, if you can't lead the basis of society, which is your family, how can you lead a secondary institution, which is the church? And again, I don't mean the church is – has has like a lesser priority. I just mean as as far as material societies created. Um, if you can't do, if you're not faithful in, in little, you can't be faithful in much. So again, I don't mean to berate people here. I'm just trying to actually encourage you. Start small. You don't have to go tackle the uh, you know the, the local college or whatever it is. But if you want to do that, there are some books that actually. Uh, are practically useful there. I think one of them, I just read this, it's called uh, Rules for Reformers. I already mentioned Douglas Wilson once. I hate to plug him again, but 
It's called Rules for Reformers. It's very good. It's it's a how-to manual for um, for taking back a little segment of society and building for Christ, and it's really good. Daryl, you got anything to add? Well, he stole my Jordan Peterson bit, so <laughs> I, I, I think he's, I think I think that's right that we have to we have to start. Um, start within the home and then work out in concentric circles. Um, and, and of course that involves certainly uh, the, the care of wives and, and children. Um, I think we want to encourage young men especially um, to, to, to seek a wife. Uh, there is some resistance in circles uh, to some of that these mm -hmm. days for, yeah. for some obvious reasons. Uh, which I, I think we're familiar with if we know young men. Um, but we, we also need to help uh, those young men um, to find uh, marriageable women. I say this as the father of three young men. Uh, so it's a, it's a very practical concern for me. Um, and in terms of the, I think, the, again, participation in the local church, again, uh, a lot of men have had difficulties with, with local churches. And, uh, you know, um, I'm not unfamiliar with, with those sorts of difficulties. Uh, but worship is a form of warfare. And um, I think we yeah. need to have our children discipled. Um, we need to have our children and ourselves under uh, biblically constituted authority. And, uh, and we need to find, um, again, like-minded men in these congregations uh, that we can serve. Um, and, and, and hopefully older men that we can learn from uh, as well. Um, which again has, has, has proven to be a, a challenge, it seems like, in the lives of a lot of young men that, that, that I've talked to. There's just a, kind of a missing uh, cohort there. Um, and, and again, I think that those are all uh, just very practical sorts of things. It may also necessitate um, you know, moving. People should be around uh, their, their extended family uh, or solid churches, or preferably both, if they're able to do so. And you know that is sometimes difficult. Um, but but uh, you know one of the blessings, I suppose, of the last year is that uh, you know we have found that a lot of men can probably earn a living uh, working at home. And uh, if they can find those sorts of jobs, um, and, and again, then reintegrate themselves into the life of their households, I think that's helpful. Um, I'm going to plug Thomas here, uh, who has done uh, several uh, podcasts with his co-host Stephen Wolf uh, on productive households and uh, what that looks like, you know, theoretically and practically, and, and how uh, our uh, ancient fathers thought about this, and so on, and I think those are uh, are, are worthy of attention from your your listeners. Well, gentlemen, uh, if anybody wants to find you, I mean, they get your book on Amazon. I'm sure other places as well, uh, which is Who Is My Neighbor? An Anthology and Natural Relations. Uh, if they want to find you guys online, maybe shoot you an email, ask you a question, or maybe read anything more, or listen to your podcast. Um, can you guys, uh, I guess we'll start with you, Thomas, uh, tell our listeners how they can do that. Sure. I'm on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Twitter is on my name, or you can just type T, Acord, A-C-H-O-R-D. I'm also on Gab. I think it's my, it's my name. It's all my name. Um, you can also email me at thomas.acord.gmail.com. And I think those are the three main places, Twitter, Facebook, Gab, email. Yeah. Uh, I am also on Facebook and uh, Twitter. Uh, it's Daryl Dow, two R's and two L's. Um, nobody ever spells Daryl right. <laughs> um, you can also find uh, my articles in the uh, uh, at the websites that uh, Tony mentioned earlier, and there's generally contact information there. But you can email me at uh, Daryl Dow at gmail.com. Well, gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thank you for writing your book, and uh, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. That was Daryl Dow and Thomas Acord, co-authors of Who Is My Neighbor, an anthology in natural relations. You are listening to the Patriarchy on the Fight, Laugh, Feast Network. We'll be right back.
don't like them putting chemicals in the water that turn the freaking frogs gay. Do you understand that? Turn, turn the, the freaking frogs, frogs gay. Boom, boom, serious crap. Gay. Frogs, freaking frogs. Boom. It's not funny. I'm going to say it real slow for you. Gay. Frogs. Mm. There we go. I found it. I found it. I still had it around there. There you go. <laughs> There's your gay frog song. Well, that was a good interview. Uh, I had not, um, I had actually not heard of those two gentlemen yet before uh, tonight, and uh, it was it was actually a real pleasure talking to them. And I think their uh, the subject matter of that is phenomenal. And I, I like the idea of having uh, all of these quotes from history. I've actually done. I've read other books like that where uh, the majority of it is a lot of quotes from various people or various church fathers uh, throughout history on, on subjects. And I think it's fascinating uh, to see, you know, where they agree and don't agree or the, the trends throughout history. But that's great. So yeah, you, everybody listen, you should go check out their book. Uh, again, it's uh, Who Is My Neighbor in Anthology and Natural Relations on Amazon. But Yeah, I got an early copy, I think, a couple years ago before they even released it. Nice. And then I got a, a free hard copy from Daryl uh, um, recently, hard which has been updated. Nice. That's nice. Hard copy. I, and, I like hard copies. And so the subject of natural um, affections, you know, which they helpfully categorized as just our, our connection, our kind of, it's natural. So it's not even something you have to deeply think about of just how, you love the people around you, the place around you. Like, like they mentioned the smell of the air or, you know, you, uh, I'm from West Virginia. So just the snow in West Virginia, and like, like it's, I'm thinking of that cause it's very snowy right now. Yes, it is <laughs> looking out and stuff. There's just, just that kind of almost sense of pride that s- swells up in you and good things come from where you're from. Yeah. You know, I live in Indiana now. And so I, I that, natural affection is here for where I live. I live in Ohio. And, so there's that. Okay. Moving on. <laughs> hey, you know, uh, here's a good joke or uh, I mean, true. I think it's true actually is, uh, what's the difference between a gay person and West Virginian number of teeth. I don't know. <laughs> the Ohio river. Oh, 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 <laughs> oh, well, that's, that's low. Okay. okay. Yeah. You're so that's he, that, for those who don't know, the Ohio River separates Ohio from West Vir- uh-huh. Virginia. Yeah. Well, that, it, it, all the gay frogs are in West Virginia, though. <laughs> yes. You, you could have just came back with the the good uh, uh, joke about the West Virginia University Library burning down. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, West Virginia University Library burnt down, and uh, both books both books got destroyed, and one hadn't even <laughs> been colored in yet. <laughs> Oh, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> no, but those kind of things are natural. Now, the Bible obviously warns us against a sinful love and desire for the things of the world. And we hold loosely our, in one sense, our connection to the world. But on the other hand, the Bible condemns those that don't have natural affection, that don't have a love for their people. And it lifts up people like Moses. You remember when God was going to destroy the Israelites? Moses is like, well, if you're going to do that, destroy me too. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you have the Apostle Paul, very similar. Right. If I could just be condemned for my people um, and so that they would be saved, I would do it. If I could be cut off so that they wouldn't be. Uh, That's a strange thing. We don't think of that today. Uh, You think of um, John Knox saying, I think it's John Knox saying, give me Scotland or I die. Mm -hmm. Uh, That... uh, um, this idea of a love for your people, a love for your family and all these things so important. And yet, uh, as, as we've seen, it's been whittled down. And part of the way it's whittled down is this accusation of racism that we saw earlier. It's like you are a, a racist if you care about America. You're a racist if you th- care about our past and history. And the whole idea is to separate you, to isolate you, and then to be able to control you. Mm -hmm. But how do we recover that? Um, I mean, that that could be whole series of podcasts on how to recover natural affection. But we we're we're talking about in this season virtues, and the virtues that we've been talking about lead us to this area and and beyond. So we're one of the virtues 
that we're going to be talking about uh, an upcoming episode is the virtue of love. And this is kind of our, we're calling this episode, I think love part one, but this is really, uh, um, uh, this, the beginning of love starts with loving those around you and where God's placed you. And so to develop natural affection, it's a weird thing to say because it should be natural, <laughs> but be- yeah. because of where we're at, we have to work at it. It's a, it, it can be hard to love your country when things are happening around us. And it's like, how do we love it? Well, you have to ask God to teach you to love others, to be a, have a compassionate heart. Sometimes I think just getting off of social media, getting out of your head and just enjoying things that are a part of life. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, sometimes I we watch with my kids little videos of like just people – like winning videos. Have you ever seen those on YouTube? Yes, like there's yeah, like yeah. people winning. Yep. And like, it's like talented things. And when I watch them, I just, I'm reminded, I, I've, I've thought obviously of natural affection and just like love for a fellow human mm-hmm. and that God has created them and that kind of thing. So developing that, developing that for your families, many people grew up with families that are broken and all those things. So it's like, how do you have that sense of loyalty? Got to ask God for it. It's that fifth commandment. What a lot of what the show is built on is honor your father and your mother. And that takes faith in God, faith in him. So um, developing the virtues, just as Peter says, start with faith. Then you add to that virtue and all the things that he says. So uh, go ahead, Tony. One of the things actually I've been trying to do with my kids this it kind of goes on to it because it's not um i mean as in christianity being a nation the nation of god um i've when we talked about christian history um with my kids uh i've actually referred to christians throughout history as our people um to my kids at times and i've tried to remind them of you know our, our people have done this before and and i've i've told them what i meant by that but that we are part of um, you know, God's people and that we are a people group and that we should think of them in that way that, you know, these are, these are fathers in the faith or these are, you know, um, other people that have come before us and have, have said these things. So I, I've, it's been interesting trying that with my kids to see how then they've started to view, um, even who they read about in the Bible, um, as being connected to them, um, because we are. And, and and having this, in a way, throughout through history, a natural affection for uh, people that have come before us, but also that builds on it because, you know, I've even referred to people at our church as our people. And, you know, these are also our people. And that they've seen that, especially the, the church we're at, um, they've seen how people care for each other. And they've seen how, even when we first came to this church, um, how readily people cared for us. It was like, almost like, we were already family, and that we were already their people, and they were already our people. And and my kids have started to see, especially my, my two older ones, and um, that's just a little thing I've started to do with them. Um, I mean, obviously that pertains um, to a natural affection to people in the church as well, and I mean, uh, we also will probably expand upon natural affection to just people like your neighbors and your nation, your state, things like that later on, but that's what I was uh, kind of mulling around my head. Yeah, yeah. Actually, oh, it's it's the the natural relations that are meant to then that kind of provide a foundation for our relation with those in the church. So, uh, the love that we have for our natural mom and dad, mm-hmm. our our people in that sense of like who our people are from our ancestors, it models for us. It points us to this reality of the people that God's made us to be. So we, we, it's, uh, we are in one sense as we're like citizens of two, two nations, right? Right. right. We are the citizen of the, of the nation that God's given us. And that's where the natural affection, but that natural affection teaches us to really have a love for this other kingdom, which is the kingdom of God that we're part of that, that you're saying. And so, yeah, that's our people. We have, we, our people consist of its, our family and then more in a more higher sense 
our people can f- consist of the church and love for each other. And, and uh, that's why we call each other brother and sister. Amen. Well, as our episode for this week, um, if you are not yet a Fight, Laugh, Feast Club member, I've said this before, and I want to actually keep saying this. Uh, if you already are, actually, and you know somebody who's not, uh, you can buy them a gift uh, membership. You can uh, you can contact Gabe and them at Cross Politic, and um, they can tell you how to do that. And there are also multiple tiers of membership. So if you're thinking, man, I just can't afford to pay you know 50 bucks a month or something like that, that's one higher, way higher level of membership. There are ones way below that. They have varying levels of, you know, you may get a shirt, you may not get a shirt, but you're still going to get access to all of the things to listen to and watch uh, behind the paywall. So, Did you say multiple tiers, though? Like, so, multiple tiers. So, basically, what Tony is trying to tell you is give till it, you have to cry. Give till it hurts. Th- this is true. You, you, will get a, <laughs> you will get a patriarchy mug, and you have to cry into it. And however much you cry into it is, is, is how much you get out. No, I'm not kidding. Yeah. You can get a patriarchy mug, though. It brings me to my next point. <laughs> if you go to confessionalware.com and you click on podcast collaborations, you can get some of our merchandise. We do have two coffee mugs and a bunch of shirts right now. And we have more things coming. Um, I am actually working on trucker hats right now. Um, so stay tuned for that. We may have to do a pre-order on that one. Uh, but you can go support us that way. Like I said, you can go support us by becoming a member or buying a membership for somebody else. I think that's a really neat thing to do, especially right now, where a lot of things are still just closed. Um, whether you agree with it or not, it's still closed. It's hard to go out and do things. So sometimes it is nice to be able to listen to something. Or you can even you know, gather around uh, family and listen to some of the sermons or things that are behind the paywall or any of the other talks. Um, or you know, after the kids are in bed, you and the missus can sit down and listen to our After the Sandwich show where we kind of talk about life and all the other things too so go to fightleftfeast.com click to sign to become a member and use the code patriarchy to support our show and you can also go to confessionalware.com and get our merchandise there and also one last thing before we go we are trying to make it to south dakota for the fight left feast network rally uh, that is from april 29th to may 1st in south dakota we really do want to go but we live on the other side of the united states so it's a lot more expensive for us to get there Uh, This is not our full-time job. (laughs) We have other full-time jobs and growing families. So we have actually started to go fund me to get the two of us uh, out there to be able to pay for us to to travel and and stay there. We'd like to set up a booth. Uh, Joseph would like to bring his books that he's been writing for uh, little boys and little girls. I'd like to bring some merchandise and really just go out there and support the good state of uh, South Dakota for being open and uh, being a good state. And also see you guys and be able to shake hands and give hugs and Maybe go out to dinner with you guys or have a cigar. Um, I had I had a great time uh, last year um, at the Fight, Laugh, Feast uh, Network uh, conference um, down in uh, Tennessee. Got to have some cigars with people. Um, shout out to you guys. Uh, you know who you are. So if you want to support us with that, um, we've put out that link on uh, various couple places, out on our Facebook page and our other social media accounts. And on Gab as well. We are also on Gab. You can find us there at Patriarchy Podcast. So please, if, if you do have some extra money and you want to support us, um, please go and donate to our uh, GoFundMe so we can get to South Dakota and uh, make it out there and see you guys. So until next time, if you have not yet bowed your knee to Christ, repent and believe. And if you have, this is our call to you. Build, fight, protect, lead. This is the Patriarchy. Thank <laughs> you.